Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Glimpel, Dr. Nigerman, um, for inviting uh, me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I was here last week in Frankfurt, so this is my second visit in, uh, in two weeks. Um, the, I mean, the opportunities that the digital world gives us to share and understand cultural heritage are enormous. But if we can share that in an open way, I think those possibilities become infinite. It's the title of actually the Europeana Publishing Framework, and I'm going to come back to that. Digitization does, in my view, enable access to cultural heritage, and it can make an important contribution to our understanding and knowledge. But obviously, we need to get the results of that digitization out to where the people are so that they can actually use it in their daily lives. And this requires cooperation on many levels. Some are corporations are more successful than others, but actually I struggle to think of the downsides of uh, cooperation. The only thing I could really think of on, in a global way was that more automation is not actually lightening our workloads, but making, it, uh, making them much more heavy. The more emails you produce, the more responses you get to your emails, uh, the more work that you end up having to do. And, and in some ways, I think digitization has also given us uh, that. So yes, we can cooperate more. That is absolutely fantastic. But it really eats into your life. So um, I will talk about cooperations and the ingredients that make them work. And I'll touch on the improvements that can be made and where actually sometimes it's difficult to achieve consensus across Europe. I think making our heritage work in the digital world is both a moral and an economic um, obligation. Morally, sharing helps us to connect our cultures, to underline our joint past, uh, to put aside our differences and to understand each other. Economically, digitization creates the possibility for new innovations, new applications, whole new industries. It contributes to our sustainability. I don't think culture should become a museum or a library or an archive um, of the past, but it needs to contribute to that democratized access to knowledge and our futures. So digital availability in an open way, I think, allows uh, just that. John Monet, um, so this year saw the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. And while Europe had its has its troubles, as we know. Uh, its fundamental ideas, I think, are still very much alive. And Europeana is, if you like, the ultimate collaboration for Europe, and one in which cultural heritage needs to play an even stronger part. As many of you will know, Europeana was very much built on the dreams of a ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. Uh, the drive to assure economic and social progress of all countries, and the subsequent elimination of the barriers which divide Europe. This is literally taken from the text of the Treaty of Rome. So in short, what was for Jean Monnet only a desirable utopia, if I had to do it again, I would begin with culture, is something that we have actually been putting into practice. We are collaborating across borders. A couple of weeks ago, I actually had the best meeting I've had in a long time with the Commission. Um, apologies to you with the Commission here, but we have a new Commissioner, Commissioner Gabrielle. She actually uh, was an MEP, so she comes very much from the, the what is it that people want, what is it that I should be doing for uh, people. And we saw one of her deputies, and before we even sat down, he actually said that she sees uh, culture as very important to our democracy, and actually as a, an aid in the global fight on values. 
And okay, this might be rhetoric across the EU at the moment, uh, but it is also reflected in the push that's been given to the European Year of Cultural Heritage, which came from uh, Germany as an idea in the first uh, place. Collaboration actually allows us to make our rich heritage available to everyone. European member states have, over uh, the last 15 years, uh, digitized something like over 300 million artworks, books, radio recordings, film footage, representing every aspect of our diverse cultures. This slide actually represents some of that uh, material. So it ranges from things like the early uh, Baroque by the, uh, by the Dutch artist Al Almanac to the symbolism of the Finnish painter Hugo Simberg, which you can see in the top left uh, corner, and everything in between. And this effort provides a real glimpse of Europe in its, all its unique aspects, the soul of Europe in all of its unique aspects. But our ambition is much larger. Our histories, our philosophies, and artistic interpretations are not only diverse, but also very much interlinked. Influential movements such as the Reformation, the Enlightenment, Art Nouveau, never actually started in isolation. But they spread through the continent at transformative speed. The European dream actually tells us that despite our differences, we have every reason to feel united in our diversity. And these two love letters that came from the 1914-1918 collections were written in the trenches in the First World War. The one on the left is in French, the one on the right in German. And they testify that from a human perspective, it didn't matter which side you were on. Our sorrows, our anxieties, the joys were very much the same, regardless of where you were, what side of the trench you were sitting in. So the rhetoric is fine. Um, I think the fact that this has really become much more part of what the European Commission is now talking about helps us. It helps to create a political climate that will enable all of us to hopefully get the funding that we need and... Uh, the political clout to move forward. But we do need to show the results of our uh, working together to deliver access to the cultural heritage and to keep on pressing those buttons uh, to get it uh, funded. The European Europeana has three values. Um, these are sort of pushed through almost anything that we do. The aim is that the material is usable. It works in the digital world for education, for research, for fun. That we are reliable with authentic, authoritative, high quality data from the museums, libraries, archives, and audiovisual collections. But most importantly, that everything is done to mutual benefit. So collaboration starts here. We all gain by cultural heritage institutions digitizing their material because then we can access it wherever we are for whatever reason that we might want it. But cultural institutions also gain because they become visible in the wider world, which leads hopefully to an understanding of their importance. Last year, we revisited the Europeana Strategy 2020. It led us to try and simplify our message and to create much more focus in what we were doing. So all three of the subsequent priorities are actually based on the idea of collaboration. These are all based on the idea of being a multi-sided platform that brings data in, enhances it, and makes it available to five markets. So I'm going to try and illustrate the benefits of collaboration against each of these markets, but also to point out along the way some of the difficulties uh, that, that we have faced. So there's been 
an amazing collaborative spirit that has led to the cultural heritage institutions working on and adopting standards, models, frameworks that actually mean that we can cooperate even more with each other and with other markets. I could pick quite a lot of areas of cooperation here. Um, actually, I realised sitting down there that I should have put Wikipedia in, uh, Wikimedia in the presentation, which I haven't got, but I have so many instances of where we have collaborated very well with uh, Wikimedia, not least on data quality um, and the areas which are important as far as enriching the data is concerned. Uh, together with uh, Wikimedia. But I could pick on things like rightstatements.org, um, which is a big now international movement to make sure that right statements that we put on our items are uh, interoperable across continents, so not just within uh, Europe. Um, I could pick on the Europeana data model, except if any of you know me, you know I can't explain that, so I won't bother with that one. Uh, all the work that we're doing at the moment on the impact framework, which uh, I think is going to be very influential in actually being able to get us away from calculating just uh, the numbers of what we're doing, but actually looking at the social and economic impact that we are actually having with our material. That was published yesterday, and I recommend that you look at it. What I actually want to talk to you about is the publishing framework. This came from the Europeana Network Task Force, and it's now being implemented um, across Europe. It's been translated into French, Italian, Montenegrin, Polish, Serbian, and Spanish. I think it might also have been translated into German, but I'd have to check. Um, it is really a means of being able to work with the aggregators and the cultural heritage institutions to improve the quality of their data so that they understand that according to what they are able to do with their data they will be able to get what they are able to give in terms of their data what they will get in return so um, if you are able to digitize in a fairly high quality or to put it out in a fairly high quality and to put an open license on it, then it can go all the way to tier four. That means it is usable for uh, the creative industries. At tier two and three, which it tends to be uh, maybe less open licenses, slightly less quality, it is reusable in education and uh, research. I think one of the issues in this area has been, um, so the issues in the area of the cultural heritage institutions, actually has been to, to around change. So we started Europeana in 2007, and uh, in 2007 we set up a, an aggregation infrastructure, which many of you are, are part of. And we need to change that in aggregation infrastructure. And one or two of you probably in this room know how painful the last two years have been in trying to get that change through because people want to go on doing it the way they have always uh, done it. Uh, we have moved it forward, but getting consensus on something that somebody else has invented uh, or, or became part of the invention and being able to move it forward um, in terms of, in, in a cooperative, con consensual way, um, has proven very difficult, and we're not quite there yet. So cooperation and change might be two things that don't always go together as well as we would like them to. My second market is around scaling uh, with partners. This is another form of uh, cooperation, um, another form of how we make use of partners and collaborating with partners in order to get the material out. The first market here is the research market. And the example that I've got here is actually the advisory board of Europeana Research. It's an international advisory board. It is 
people who are working together to make sure that cultural heritage will work for the digital humanities um, and that they uh, really try and put the messages across of what it is that they need, but also uh, towards their networks that this material is available for them uh, to use. They are also working um, on a grants program which uh, is out at the moment. This is a grants program towards anybody who would like to do something with the data in, uh, from a researcher point of view. So they submit their ideas. There's 25,000 euros available. It's not a huge amount. Last year we had 130 applications of which we were able to say 30 should have been funded and they ended up deciding to fund three. Now, that rather depends on the amount of money that's needed per application um, and, and what they expect to get out of it. But in terms of a means of collaborating with a very, very wide set of students, uh, researchers who want to do something with that data, getting their ide ideas, in, ideas in and then maybe being able to fund it this has been a very successful collaborative program last year, and we hope it will be uh, this year as well. The third area, the third market, is in education. And uh, for this one, I've actually chosen a different level of uh, collaboration. This is between the Ministries of Culture and Education. Uh, the European Education uh, Partners um, and the Cultural Heritage Institutions. So we got together under, I think it was the Italian uh, presidency, to create some recommendations for uh, the use of cultural heritage in education. And this year, we decided under the Maltese presidency to revisit them, but try and turn them into something that was, that something was very actionable, that you could do something with. So together, all of these uh, different types of individuals have come up with seven actions that they want to see uh, results from in the next uh, couple of years that they will take home and do something about. And this is very much about making sure that cultural heritage uh, data, the digital material, is appropriate, that it works in education, that it is fit for purpose as far as education is concerned. So the need to collaborate much wider um, is very important um, in something like education. My fourth uh, area is the creative industries. Um, and for this one, I've chosen something which is really my absolute favorite uh, of all time. Is there only one in here? Yeah, um, which is this. It's art, of, art Up Your Tab. This was done by somebody just thinking, hey, there's some really nice public domain uh, CC BY art uh, in Europeana. What could I do with it? And they have made it into a tab. It's now actually available on Firefox, Safari, and uh, Chrome. You, uh, it's an extension. You uh, download the extension, it takes you two minutes. And you get, every tab you open, a new piece of art. And it's completely serendipitous. You get all sorts of stuff that you have probably never seen. You can actually get to go in and learn a little bit about it. Um, it's terribly distracting. You just keep hitting on all the tabs, um, and you learn a bit more along the way. Some of it you don't like, but some of it is really a complete inspiration and something uh, very different to what you, what you would otherwise uh, see. This is a collaboration with somebody in the creative industries who was able to make use of the material because it was digitized and able to bring it to whole new audiences uh, uh, that would not necessarily see it. And it's getting, I can't remember the statistics for this, but the, the numbers of downloads are increasing. Um, it's very popular. It gets tweeted about a lot, and I love it. Um, the last area is around the strategic objective to engage people. So we continue to try and do that more directly with the data that we have um, in Europeana. 
The first is how do we extend the reach of the material that, um, or extend the reach really of the cultural heritage institutions and uh, Europeana in doing so. And again, I've chosen an example that I rather like, this unfortunately not actually working very well on screen. I think it's probably been downloaded. This is um, a competition that's uh, current at the moment. Uh, we give you some instructions on how to do this. In the Frankfurt Book Fair last week, we had a gift it up party, so you could actually learn on the spot how to make um, gifts. It's a collaboration with Giphy. It started in 2015. Um, and it's gradually got bigger. We work with the Digital Public Library of America, Trove, and Digital New Zealand. Uh, people love it. They come in, they make gifts, they come up with all sorts of amazing things that you can do with uh, the material. And you start to see the material in a different way. Now, if you want to be very authentic or traditional, then you're not going to like this. But I think in terms of how this is much more native to uh, how generations now, the, the, the younger generations are using uh, the web and want to use the material that's out there, this is a really, really good example. So the competition is on at the moment. Um, feel very free to enter. Uh, you get given a whole set of data that you can use, but you can also use stuff that are in with, within your own um, organizations, as long as they are in uh, the public domain or um, under a CC BY uh, license. Uh, you can't even really use the, the, the CC BY share alike, so it really has to be open data. Um, these are the examples from the last uh, few years. Um, the bottom one is from the, uh, from the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Um, it was a cartoon. And it's really unfortunate that uh, it's not moving on this screen because then you'd see actually what happens. Uh, but there you go. So the last area is around, again, around engaging people, and it is really what we do. So this is, if you like, the, the ultimate reason that Europeana was formed, to share the material that we produce digitally across borders. Um, and to do this, we create uh, collections. We've been through several ways of doing this. This is the main site. If any of you have used it, you know how difficult that is. So we have spent some time over the last uh, probably 15 months uh, creating thematic collections of the data that is in there. So yes, you get in the main site everything, all 54 million items across the whole of Europe, and it is incredibly difficult to find your way around. So the aim now is to try and drill down into this and give users uh, much more targeted collections that they can uh, use in order to um, uh, search and to get some satisfaction out of. And this is the, the uh, thematic collections. Um, I think we've actually got more than the ones that are on here now. We've got the one from European 1940-1918 that many of you will be aware of. We have one on art, uh, one on music, one on fashion, and one on photography. And we've just started to create well, you can find them on the site. Uh, there's one on sports, one on natural history, and one on, on maps and geography. How can I forget that one? Um, and those we have done in a much more automated way, and I'll tell you why and where the difficulties we, we got in terms of collaboration led us to that uh, way of working. So this is an example of a very curated uh, thematic collection. It's being done with photo consortium. It is photography across Europe. It's an amazingly beautiful site, and it's getting some serious uh, traffic uh, to it um, with enormous interest, a lot of use of that uh, material, far more than we have 
uh, on any other of the thematic collections at the moment. They're putting a lot of effort into it. They are making sure that people are aware of it, um, and they're putting a lot of effort into trying to open up the photography collections. And any of you with photography collections will know that's uh, a, a challenge. So as well as digitizing the material in order to make it available, you also have to try and find ways to make it open. But the overall results for the thematic collections are extremely good. So you, here you see uh, that the bounce rate has gone down from over 50% to 14%. People come in, they stay in. The returning visitors um, are up. The amount of time that people are spending in these thematic collections is three times the amount that they were spending on the, uh, not three times the amount, yeah, no, three times the amount, that they were spending on the, the site before. And what they are doing in there is an awful lot more uh, than they were doing before. So this is a very successful mechanism, but it is very labor intensive. We have discovered that the use of satisfaction for these sites is very good, but actually, this is based on us comparing the ones which we did automatically and the ones which are uh, much more heavily curated by a team. Now, the problem with having a whole team curating it is that costs you money. When a project is finished, so a funded project is finished, sustaining that becomes very, very difficult. So you might want to collaborate, but it's no longer part of your day job. You're not being part paid to do it. It becomes very difficult to find the time to do so. So we're changing the, the business model. We can generate these collections pretty much automatically. And then we have add-ons, which are the exhibitions where curators get acro uh, together across Europe or somebody wants to write a blog about the difference between this manuscript in uh, this country and this one in uh, this country. It really goes to the concept of going across borders um, in Europe. And the, the, the huge positive for us is that the stickiness on the automated collection sites is actually very little different to the ones where you're having to curate them uh, very thoroughly. So this is a, a route that we will go down. We still need the collaboration in order to bring the material in, in order to do some nice exhibitions in there. Um, but we have discovered that we can do with a little less curating on it in order to make it a sustainable uh, way uh, forward. So this really goes back to the European dream. Um, the map that you see is made up of all the material that we got in, or some of the material that we got in from the Europeana 280 collaboration of last year. I can't tell you how hard that was to get off the ground. Uh, one, because I couldn't get countries to tell me what their top 10 pieces of art was. Actually, it's quite reasonable, that really. Um, uh, two, that it was really difficult to get it in in the period of time, in the quality, in the open licenses. Three, that we were trying to do things that put this art onto the streets. Um, and that got me into all sorts of town planning logistics that I never even realized existed. So we thought we could have a big VR installation in front of the Notre Dame. The city of Paris said yes, and the, uh, the, the priests, the fathers of Notre Dame said no. Uh, so we then moved it to the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, um, and we did that in extremely uh, quick time, um, because actually we have this absolutely amazing uh, network of cultural heritage institutions who are always prepared to find the solutions and collaborate to get this material out um, to new audiences and new ways of working. I thank you. <laughs>
don't go to lunch break now. You have a great opportunity. You can ask questions to Jill Cousins. That's not something you can da do every day. So <laughs> where are questions to Jill? Uh, I think one at the back. Hi, Katharina Schöneborn from German National Library. Um, I have a question um, linked to what you said about education and engagement. Um, in my social network, I have a lot of teachers, um, both in schools and universities. And um, what I found is that most of them didn't know Europeana at all until I talked about them related to my work. Um, and I was wondering if, if there are any um, plans to push more into teacher education to, to raise awareness because um, these people really are the multipliers and um, can reach young persons yep. um, to yeah, raise awareness for this common cultural heritage. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's sad if even the, the younger teachers don't know this and don't use it. And all these people are in their 30s and quite keen on digital education tools. So um, that's my question to you. Is there anything you can do more? Is it limited resources? Um, is it national level that should be more active? What could be done there? All of those. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for telling your, uh, your teacher friends about it. Um, it's, uh, this last year, we've had a big push on education. So we were, or we still are, working with the international organizations, the European organizations like European School Nets, Euroclio for history teachers, and they take the material in and they make it work with their systems. We've just managed to get a decent collaboration with eTwinning, which um, I hope will bear fruit for more people being aware of what is going on, uh, the fact that it's a free resource fundamentally and that they can use it. Um, the aim of the, the policy actions is actually to increase that awareness, so to make sure that the ministries of culture are telling the ministries of education that there is a free resource available. Last year, we started a really good collaboration with the Ministry of Education in France, and we've used it as a, a, a pilot. It actually came from them to do it in the first place. And what they wanted was all the non-French material. They're not interested. They think they can get the French material. Um, or they've probably already got it in their system. Um, and they wanted everything that wasn't French in the kind of licenses that would be possible to use it um, uh, within education in France. So they, um, we've got a dedicated area on edutech, uh, which is a very centralized way of uh, having resources and tools for teachers in France. Uh, we are also about to include the API so that when you search in there, you will also get the resources coming up. So we have never thought that we are going to get teachers to come into the Europeana collections. They will not find their way around there. They don't have the time to do it. Actually, most of them want it as, as a, a learning resource. They don't want it as a, uh, just an item. Um, so we're hoping that by putting it within the systems, this will work. Now the problem is, I need to do that at each country. So this year I'm doing five others. Germany isn't one of them yet, but I would very happily, um, this year as in I mean through to halfway of 2018, I would very happily have the same conversation with the German Ministry of Education although I bet it's not easy here uh, because, of the, uh, because of the very democratic structures that you have in place. Um, and that actually was something happened yesterday in a meeting in the Netherlands, which is another country with very democratic structures in place, so much so that there isn't really a national curriculum. So each school, each teacher, is able to decide what they want to do, and there is no general set of resources um, available for them. Then getting to them becomes very difficult. We even asked them, how can we get to the teacher training colleges? And they said, uh, don't know, they're like the schools. Uh, they also operate independently. 
So we've left them with the problem. I don't expect to get the answer soon, but this is how we're working. Um, so if next year I can include Germany in some way, I would be really pleased to do so. Stefan. <laughs> Nothing difficult. <laughs> um, I just wanted, I'm Stefan Bartelmeier from the German Digital Library, uh, hosted here at the German National Library. I just wanted to comment, Europeana is already sort of part of the discussion via us, the national aggregator, because we are uh, uh, working on an infrastructure level with several uh, projects that are aiming for school clouds yeah. on a, on a yeah. federal and also on a, on a state level in Germany. So you are already part of the discussion. Right. <laughs> so you're doing my job for me, which I always find to be fantastic. <laughs> Okay, um, one more short question. Thank you very much for your excellent in, um, presentation. Uh, I have a follow-up question to your remarks, uh, the relationship to national digital libraries. Are you more competing with them or collaborating with them? How would you describe this? I think very definitely, I mean, we can't do our job without them. Uh, so very definitely collaborating uh, with them. And I think, uh, well, Uwe, Uwe and uh, Stefan could certainly say um, from their side what that really means, but, uh, and whether I'm telling the truth or not. Um, but actually, I think it's a real, um, really, really useful relationship because we're going through similar things. We actually get to talk about the issues that both of us share, whether it's how do you manage the politicians, where do you get the funding from, to um, can we cooperate on creating frameworks for things um, so that we're not doing it in isolation. So I, I think that I would like to see more of them. Um, there are not that many throughout Europe uh, that are really cross-domain national aggregations, uh, which is a shame because I think they really do help surface the material that's been digitized within the country, getting it out into things like education, doing the collaborations uh, for you. But they also really help getting that material for the smaller institutions in particular, beyond the borders of that country, uh, which I think otherwise is quite challenging. Thank you very much.